Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Library of Congress National Book Festival, back in person again after two years online. Very exciting. Um, I'm excited to welcome you to this session, My Body, Not Myself, Wrestling with Identity, here at the Writer's Studio stage. Um, for this session, we are featuring two acclaimed writers who have just written a memoir. Um, to my immediate uh, left is Sarah Rule, who wrote Smile, the story of a face, right here, um, uh, which is about her story of suffering partial face paralysis uh, that left her incapable of accurately communicating her feelings. And we'll hear more about that. Uh, to my further left is Diana Getch and her book, The Body I, sorry, This Body I Wore, a memoir, is about uh, her chronicle of a full account of her trans life. So I'm thrilled to have them here today to talk about their memoirs and to uh, connect about what it takes to create such an account. Um, my name is Rob Casper. I'm the head of poetry and literature at the Library of Congress. Uh, I'm thrilled to be here, thrilled to be, uh, uh, as a poetry person, sharing the stage with two memoirists who uh, write in all sorts of genres, including poetry. Uh, before we begin by talking about their memoirs, though, I do want to give a special shout out to the National Endowment for the Arts, the sponsor of this stage. Uh, please give me a hand uh, for the National Endowment for the Arts. If you don't know about the NEA and want to learn more, there's a table in the back there. You can talk to the literature director, Amy Stoles, uh, one of the great figures of, uh, of uh, the literary world and her staff, uh, and find out about what the uh, endowment does to promote uh, poets and writers. Uh, I want to tell you a little bit about the format of this event. We will have a moderated discussion for around 40, 45 minutes. We will have 15 minutes at the end of the session for you to ask questions. You see there are two mics up here, so we just ask that you come up and um, read your questions, um, speak your questions from the mic so that we can make sure to record them and we can hear you well. Uh, I also wanna note that both of our writers will be doing book signings shortly afterwards uh, from five to six down in Hall C at the lower level across the street. So be sure to pick up they're beautiful, wonderful books um, if you don't already have them. So let me begin by just asking each of our writers if they might give us a little bit of uh, insight into their books and the backstory behind their books, how they came to write them and what the books are about. So maybe Sarah, you could start. Sure, and I just wanna thank you for the introduction. It's such an honor to be here all together and um, uh, to welcome people I know, friends, and, and, and friends who I don't know, and book lovers. And if anyone would like to come up um, closer to the front, um, feel welcome to. Um, so how I came to write the book. You know, in a way, I fought writing this book for a long time, and I never thought it was a subject I actually wanted to write about. And I think um, it felt like such an interior experience. Um, facial paralysis, otherwise known as, as Bell's palsy in my case. And I think because it was a little bit traumatic too, I just, I just wanted it to go away. I didn't want it to be a fit subject for anything, <laughs> my writing life or my face. Um, I really just wanted it to go away. Uh, and for most people, Bell's palsy is kind of a transient illness that goes away within three months. And in my case, it was just very, very slow going. So I had sort of really complete paralysis um, for close to 10 years, I would say, on this side of my face. And it happened after I had twins um, and they'd had a pretty um, traumatic birth um, and were miraculously healthy. And then a lactation consultant came in and said, your eye looks a little droopy. Um, and I, I was slightly offended and said, well, I'm Irish or something. Um, <laughs> And then I looked in the mirror and, and this whole side of my face had fallen down. Um, and I think grappling with what it meant to 
not be able to express joy on my face or not feel as though I was expressing joy on my face, um, particularly smiling at my kids, was really hard. Um, so the book, I think, was, was quite cathartic to write, was sort of healing to write, but I think it took a really long time for me to metabolize the experience and to begin to make a narrative out of it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So um, I, w I just want to echo Sarah's appreciation for everyone who got us here, the NEA, uh, the National uh, Book Festival, and Rob, and, um, and everyone. Um, what a pleasure. Uh, for me, I, I came up as a poet, and you know, decades, years and years, just did the poetry thing. But before any of that, when I was in high school, I wanted to be a novelist. Mm -hmm. the clearest statement to myself of a future. I don't know how it was going to happen. And then I just sucked at writing fiction. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't know why I couldn't turn the corner on a story. And then I wind up you know, writing poems that are very narrative, mm -hmm. very narrative, mm -hmm. except um, you know, they're, because they're poems, people think they're true. And I stumbled into having this, this great poetry mentor named Stephen Dunn, whose first advice to students is to become bored with yourself. Hmm. Um, you, know, you, get a, you get a shot, actually, of being interesting to the reader if you're bored with yourself. And that policy kind of did me well. Hmm. And uh, when I transitioned, I, uh, I wanted, I was still bored with myself. <laughs> <laughs> Although a lot of other people weren't. <laughs> like suddenly, you know, you're the blue plate special now, you know, and they're really fascinated with this journey and all this stuff. But then I wasn't bored when I realized, looking back, mm. that I had been part of a milieu that is fading out of memory. And that is this um, subculture mm -hmm. of, uh, quote, straight male unquote, cross-dressers in New York City in the 1980s and the 1990s. And I had plunged myself into that world, not knowing it was even remarkable or even worth writing about, frankly. I, it was just, I was doing it. And at the same time, I was teaching at Stuyvesant High School and just kind of attempting to stumble my way through life. And it was only after the this unbelievable explosion in trans visibility that I never thought I'd live to see in my lifetime. And then once that happened, and I came out with it, I saw this other unbelievable thing, which was that world. Mm -hmm. And suddenly I wasn't bored with myself mm -hmm. enough to want to commit this act of prose. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, let's jump into what it meant uh, for both of you to sort of contend with the memoir form. Um, the books have very different timelines, uh, but they do try to sequence a kind of jumping around um, uh, chronologically to sort of tackle, tackle their subjects. Maybe you want to talk about what that meant for both of you, how you negotiated that. Uh, I was even just thinking, looking at them both, how they use chapters and chapter titles, uh, as poets do, with great chapter title names to kind of frame things. Do you want to dive in? I'm being looked at. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. I, it, for me, it was a strategy of dealing with overwhelm. The overwhelm of writing a memoir and then the overwhelm of kind of experience itself. And the way I tackled it was to just um, bite off something very small. Yeah. So I'd start with putting myself in a physical place in the present tense and starting to describe what I do know because there's so much I didn't know about how I was going to write these chapters. But I did know like I was sitting on an orange couch in 1981. I mean, it's, it was that concrete. Okay, what does the couch look like? I can do that. I think I can do a couch. Okay, let's go to the wall you know, and then out the window, and then who's in the other room. And it was in the present tense. And then somewhere in the middle of all that, I receded into past tense and started catching a narrative. And I thought I would let go of that opening strategy. 
And you know, it was kind of like the on-ramp, they say, and, and I didn't. They kind of stayed in there. So each of the 19 chapters is fairly unitary. And it helped me just to say, okay, I'm going to conquer this one little chapter. And it wound up working out okay and just leaving space between something James McPhee talks about when they ask James McPhee about, you know, this kind of interstitial transition material. He says, I don't do transitions. Mm-hmm. He just has to break in the page and then a new phase of whatever asset and this incredible trust of the reader. Mm. And I wanted the chapters to be kind of like islands. Um, and that also kind of helped to convey how scattershot a trans life, especially a closet of trans life could be. You're always starting again. Who am I now? Where am I now? Mm-hmm. Um, so I kind of kept it and the editors allowed me to. <laughs> Did it seem like the kind of thing you knew how to do, that kind of leaping from being a poet, from putting together books of poetry? Or did it seem like suddenly a whole new kind of way of imagining uh, your voice? I mean, I say yes and a no. I mean, my way of writing poems is to walk in the dark. You know, it's the Keats negative capability. You just, um, you just go and you don't plan past a certain point. And this really was a walk in the dark. I mean, I was using every technique I ever learned. I needed every trick in the book for this. So in a way, it's a little like that, you know, every new poem, you throw the leaves up in the air, it never gets easier. But somehow this was prose, the, the margin would appear on this other side <laughs> of the Pacific Ocean somehow. So Sarah, what about you? Of course, you're, in addition to being a poet and an essayist, a playwright. So you're used to creating these big narratives through, through um, uh, dialogue. Mm-hmm. What did it feel like to have this kind of approach? Well, I was so interested in what you said about the form reflecting the content, the idea that the, that the chapter break was reflective of the kind of leaps in experience. Yeah. And I found that for myself, the tenses became also reflective. You know, as a, as a playwright, you always are writing in the present tense, pretty mm-hmm. much. Mm-hmm. Um, there's not really a reason to write in the past tense. So I found my my first draft, my tenses were all over the place and I didn't think anything of it. And my wonderful editor, Mary Sue Ruchi, was like, your tenses are all over the place. Um, And I realized that um, there's something non-linear about illness and healing. And so at a point I thought, well, I want the illness part to be in the past tense and I want the healing to be in the present tense. Mm. So then I went through and created that as a form for myself. And I thought, what a gift that, that that editor gave me, you know, to put put illness in the past tense, to kind of banish it there. And I think the process felt to me kind of like unpeeling an onion. I, it's not, I didn't, I didn't write it chronologically. I just kind of attacked the whole, the whole, and then tried to break it up into chunks. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And how did you both figure out the ultimate order? I mean, you have. 31 chapters that go sequentially. There is a, uh, in, in this body of war, a part one, a part two, a part three, yeah. uh, a prologue and an epigraph, an epilogue. So, you know, it had a kind of overarching structure too. How did you sort of determine as you were moving along how that made sense? Um, something told me to start in the middle. Mm. Uh, this is Sarah's book and mine, I think having that in common. We start in the middle, somewhere in the middle of life, the rush of life. And, um, And then in the middle part went back to the past. I said, okay, after about 100 pages, the reader's going to say she hasn't said a thing about her family. Mm. You know, she hasn't said a thing about childhood. And I kind of wanted that suspense, because usually, what what is it Holden Caulfield says? All that David Copperfield crap (laughs) when when you begin at the beginning. (laughs) So it it just felt organic to me, and I I kept it that way. Uh, and I noticed Sarah did a lot of mm-hmm. uh, flashback, flash forward, and that's just fun to do as well. If you start in the middle, you can go both directions, mm-hmm. yeah. you know, from that. Yeah, yeah. And that's what consciousness is like, yeah. you know, that's the wonderful thing about prose that you can do. You, you can skip back and forth narratively. And I loved the freedom of that. Um, and I agree, you know, with a poem, it often comes whole, you know, whole cloth to you, but a memoir doesn't. So, um, and I wanted the reader to have an experience of 
some form of momentum, but I really wasn't sure my story had one. And at the end of writing it, I thought, oh, really the form of my book is a woman slowly gets better. And I kind of thought, well, what kind of story is that? You know, that's not very, um, <laughs> very momentous. There's no catharsis. Um, but I ended up feeling like that was a dramatic story in its way. Mm -hmm. You know, not the kind of drama we're used to seeing on stages, but dramatic in a, in a quieter, more interior way. Mm -hmm. uh, you both deal with the sort of uh, experiences that have that seem exceptionally long um, and negotiate that uh, in ways that say something about uh, struggle and understanding and I wonder if you both could read a section from your books that might speak to that that we might be able to discuss I am once again being looked at <laughs> <laughs> we like to look at you <laughs> So uh, actually, Rob and I talked a little about this, and it's incredible. Both books are soaking in time, references to time, concerned about time, more than I knew at the time. Mm. Um, and often in the book, I found myself looking at the second draft, third draft, remarking how many times I'm stating, I am this age, I am this age, I am this right. age. And it was like a ticking clock. But this is, this is from the epilogue. And I'll just read, um, it's, uh, it's just a couple paragraphs. I often think about a 55-year-old African-American military vet who wore one of her wife's dresses to a support meeting I attended in 2014. She was crying because she waited too long to transition. No, she was bawling, doubled over, heaving and sobbing for a long time. I was 50, and I wanted to say something positive about transitioning late. I'm glad I didn't. Her abject grief for decades of a life not lived in her gender consecrated that space. I don't know, uh, the tide of that grief wouldn't roll over me for a few more years. I don't know if it'll ever recede. The experiences of late and early transitioners are like night and day. Early transitioners were unable to conceal from themselves or others the fact that they were trans. Late transitioners were unable to unearth it. Trans women's history has centered on early transitioners, which makes sense. They were the ones who were out struggling to survive in the face of violence, poverty, AIDS. They were the ones marching and forming alternative families and communities. Meanwhile, late transitioners struggled to live as men, often, though not always, engaging in cross-dressing. Many of the cross-dressers I knew in the 80s and 90s were trans and didn't know it. But I have yet to meet a trans person of any age who isn't filled with regret for not transitioning sooner. Mm. Thank you, yeah, it's a remarkable, <laughs> remarkable arrival, a remarkable realization. And um, it also points to how many, how much history happened throughout the 50 years you were describing, yeah. uh, and the history that led you to the moment of transition, but also the people that you met along the way and their experiences, and that sense of regret in every, each and every one. And maybe you want to talk about how the book chronicles the lives of other, other um, trans people uh, in, these, in these sort of historical moments? Well, a, a lot of the people I'm thinking of, you know, never made it out of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, the life, before this recent explosion in trans visibility, the life expectancy of what were called transsexual people uh, was just somewhere in the 40s. Mm. I mean, it was, um, it was like a death sentence. But then not transitioning was a little like a living death. Yeah. You know, and, and one of the things I say later on in the epilogue 
um, which is one of the things that convinces me this is a universal subject. Any person of any gender, if you picture for yourself, what if you could have everything you would ever want, just sitting right there now, you know, in terms of family, people you love, career, finances, where you live, housing, whatever it is, the things you wanted most, uh, with the one condition that you have to live with those things outside of your gender, in exile from your gender. You would not take that deal, which is the deal forced on every, I want to say forced, but it's the deal facing every trans person at birth. And I think maybe that's why even, I've, I've met teenagers who regretted not coming out sooner. And I have not one ounce of condescension because it's like a living death, you know, in, in, in a sense. And it's, but it's hard to put into words. Yeah. You know, but there's that regret. Yeah. Sarah, might you read a passage sure. for us as well? And, and just to say that's something I really, really admired about your book, among many things, that, that search for language around something that's not had language wrapped around it, you know, it's really. Thank you. Um, I too will read from the epilogue. Um, I woke up from a dream this morning in which I was saying, in a nutshell, I am not a nutshell. The ends of stories are places to put nutshells, lessons. This is my big chance to tell you how I walked a pilgrim's progress out of the slough of dust bond into the celestial city, perhaps of Brooklyn. I am, suspicious, I, am, I am suspicious of lessons and morals that I might extract from suffering, so why do I continue to seek them? I am with the children at a bay in Cape Cod, visiting Paula Vogel, the same teacher who told me I'd write again after having three children, the same teacher who said she'd take care of me and then did. Now again, she is making a place for me to write, giving me a desk and all the Yorkshire tea I want to drink. The twins are looking for shells on the beach. They arrange them on the sand. Which is your favorite, they ask me. I choose a small iridescent broken shell. But don't you like this one, they ask, pointing to a less broken, more perfect bland shell. No, I like the broken shell, I say. It's iridescent. And I think imperfection is a portal whereas perfection and symmetry create distance. Our culture values perfect pictures of ourselves, mirage, over and above authentic connection. But we meet one another through the imperfect particular of our bodies. Imperfection calls out for affinity, for the beloved to say, I too am broken, but may I join you? What if I stop thinking of my smile as a flash of symmetry, but instead a flash of affinity? Fragility invites care. Japanese poetry, which celebrates the hidden, the implied, and impermanence is asymmetrical. The haiku has an uneven number of syllables, five, seven, five, and the three lines call out to the reader to supply the invisible fourth line. Japanese aesthetics also celebrates wabi-sabi, the idea that imperfection is a doorway into a piece of art. And as I've been practicing writing haiku, I think about the flaw in the weave. This haiku took me, in a sense, 10 years to write. A crooked smile is better than a crooked heart. Open me to God. Um, I'd love to talk about the, the, the uh, power of Buddhism the importance of Buddhism in both your memoirs. You referenced that uh, as well as um, Japanese haiku poetry um, and sort of how Buddhism came into and helped you grapple with uh, uh, this long period of going through, uh, dealing with all sorts of experts and doctors and different kinds of procedures and possible, you know, um, quote unquote cures and also um, I'm being told that it was you, your face was never going to be the same again. It would never get better. Yeah, I did have a lot of bad doctors. <laughs> um, yeah, we both seem to have little little bracelets. <laughs> uh, it was interesting to find out that we're both sort of practiced Tibetan Buddhism, um, and I was raised Catholic, and 
I suppose the book is, in a way, a spiritual autobiography. Um, and I remember when I started meditating, I, I, I loved um, Thich Nhat Hanh, and I had bought one of his books about anger because the diagnosis made me angry. Um, and so in one of his, his instructions on anger, he says, now, as you meditate, smile. Because um, if you feel, like if you put the smile on your face, you will feel happy. And I was kind of like, oh my God, I cannot. I'm just chucking this book against the wall. Um, so getting to a place, you know, where it was, there was an internal smile, you know, that I could feel. Um, and that eventually started to get, my face did actually get, get better over the years, even though the neurologist told me that it wouldn't. Um, and that took, that took a lot of time. And I, and I think it's, it's hard to write about um, coming to spiritual conclusions, but, it, but they're some of my favorite form of memoir. I, I, love, I love me a good St. Augustine confessions. Um, and, and so in some ways, I think, I think that runs through the book. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You talked about Montaigne versus St. Augustine. <laughs> And I was reading your book, I'm thinking, this is a Montaigne book, I'm doing a St. Augustine book. Oh, interesting. <laughs> <laughs> but you too have a moment, a, a really powerful moment in a cabin when suddenly you're, you're on, a, on a Buddhist retreat, right? And yeah. have to kind of be there. Maybe you could talk about that. So yeah, there's a chapter called In the Cabin of the Crazy One. There's actually a guru known as the Crazy One, so. Um, and this was the cabin of the crazy one. I was doing a 10-day solo spiritual retreat. I was doing tantric energy practices. And in the tantra, there's a teaching known as the three bodies of the Buddha. There's the dharmakaya, the body of space, the sambhogakaya, the energy body. And there's the nirmanakaya, which is the manifest body, the body you wear. And uh, this sends you back, these practices send you to the other bodies. Um, I've argued with some of my Buddhist friends whether the energy body has a gender or not. <laughs> it's been very interesting debate. What do you think? Yeah, what's your, what's your side on that? I take the position it does. Uh -huh. My friend says no. <laughs> She's cisgender. <laughs> um, we agree that the, the body of space, the Dharmakaya, doesn't have a gender. Yeah. We've, we've concluded. <laughs> But yeah, the, these practices just kind of, you know, open you. I mean, I, it wasn't the first time I was doing it, so I was really settling into this impossible practice known as the nundro. You you repeat these things 108,000 times, and then the last one of the four you do one million. You actually count to a million. That's why we have beads. And, um, and somewhere in the middle of all of that losing oneself into the energy body and the body of space, um, you dismantle. You let go, let go, let go. And you know, what's left? You know, and um, I think that's why nothingness and emptiness is such a big deal in Buddhism, because they're interested in what's left. And what was left uh, was a woman's heart. And that was just my experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Diana, you end your epilogue with, with um, the statement, uh, I might have saved my own life. And I thought about that a lot, both in terms of how you talked about um, transitioning in the book, but also, of course, that is a uh, surprising theme in Smile, too. And maybe um, without giving too much away, um, Sarah, you can talk about sort of how the stakes change midway through the book and what that meant. Mm -hmm. um, yes, well, there's this, there's this Buddhist parable about the farmer's luck um, where, where this, um, this young man is, is told he has to go to war the next day and then, oh no, so, sorry, first he breaks his leg. He breaks his leg and um, people come and say, oh, what bad luck. And the parents say, maybe, and then the next day, you know, he's told that he's supposed to go to war. It's some, it's some, I'm, I'm not doing it justice, but I guess the, the parable of the maybe is that 
what you think of as your bad luck sometimes has good luck inside of it. So for me, the Bell's palsy diagnosis was um, a hard thing to experience, but it ended up revealing another condition that I had called celiac disease, um, which apparently my father had too as a baby and didn't know about it. Um, and he died of cancer when he was um, in his early 50s and celiac is an autoimmune condition that can cause a cluster of other autoimmune conditions and my daughter has it too. So, um, you know, inside a, a non-fatal diagnosis, an annoying diagnosis and a um, psychologically burdensome diagnosis of Bell's palsy was this other medical information that, that might have saved my life. Mm -hmm. And the memoir is contending with that as much as it is ultimately contending with the, with the challenges of um, the struggles that you were dealing with uh, in, in uh, trying to address your Bell's palsy. Yeah, and I think because the, the Bell's palsy descended right after having twins and I had this toddler too, there was a, there was a, a big space of postpartum depression where all of that kind of came together and it was hard to write, it was hard to function. Um, but I don't think, I, you know, I had this plucky Midwestern attitude about the whole thing and I didn't want my family to know or my friends to know um, or my husband to know. Um, but I think it was pretty profound. So, so writing the book, I think, also helped me put language around that. You know, it's funny, even just last night, I had a dream, probably because I knew I was going to speak about this, that um, my husband gave me a surprise party for my birthday, but it was 10 years ago, and there was a video of it, and I was looking at it, and in the video, I couldn't smile. Mm -hmm. And so I'm watching the video thinking, I know I was happy, but I'm not smiling. You know, so, so that schism, which I think in a way isn't unique to people with Bell's palsy, but people have all kinds of ways that their face doesn't match their interior life for whatever reason. Sometimes your face is smiling, but internally, internally you're not. Um, so writing about the experience, I think, gave me a way to narratively wrap my head around that. Yeah, yeah. I'd also like to talk to the both of you about the cultural standards of body and identity that you are contending with and the, the, the dangers of that, the, the, um, the insidious um, um, way in which those standards can keep you disconnected and how the books really think through in different ways and again with these very different timelines, um, that kind of sense of contending with this connection. Yeah. Well, I don't think outside of being in community, you can know yourself as human. Mm. Yeah. And, you know, again, historically, people who are out and transsexual, um, you're just not included. You're out of the family. Also, you go further back in the gay community as well. I mean, mm -hmm. when it wasn't a community, you couldn't have a community. And uh, you're out of families you're unemployed instantly. You know, housing, I mean, all of these institutions, the things that people live for, mm -hmm. you know, you transition, it's over. And so, and, and that's not because of who you are. It's, it's, you know, the weight of a culture is huge and potentially, you know, deadly. Mm -hmm. And, you know, your capacity to bond will be affected by coming out and it will be affected by not coming out in some other, you know, different way. You know, when, when Sarah was reading this passage about symmetry, mm -hmm. I was hoping you'd get to the word dread, mm. because that, when you use that, the dread of symmetry, that word hit me like a ton of bricks. Mm -hmm. You know, that, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure of the exact context, but the idea that you view, you start to view symmetry or passing, or some acceptable form of gender expression mm -hmm. as this incredibly precarious thing. Mm -hmm. Whereas for everyone else, it ain't nothing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, what is the William Blake, what, what dread face and what dread eye have something thy fearful symmetry, have framed thy fearful Frame symmetry? Frame thy fearful, thy fearful symmetry. symmetry. Tiger, tiger. Yep, burning Fearful bright. symmetry, I mean, yeah. I mean, I think we make so many horrific binaries in our culture, so many horrific um, symmetries. 
And I mean, obviously, I think my, my mine is so different as an experience um, um, from what from what you went through. Um, I guess with with my own facial stuff, I think so much about girls and Instagram and how depressed girls are right now culturally. And I think a lot is to do with that, you know, seeing the face um, over and over again, reproduced, um, other other girls trying to make symmetrical features with um, with apps. And I think for me, one big lesson was when I started physical therapy finally, which my neurologist said, oh, that doesn't, that doesn't do anything, don't, don't even try. But actually it did help me quite a bit. And, um, and I learned that a smile is a doing, you know, it's not, it's not, um, it's not about vanity. It's a, it's an expression. It's a muscle. It takes a lot of muscle actually to create joy or to express joy. So thinking about what I could do with my face rather than how my face was seen was a revelation for me. Just one more question and then I'm excited to open things up to, to all of you. Uh, and like I said, remember if you wanna ask questions, please come up. Um, obviously, the literary memoir has a rich history. I wonder if there were memoirs that you turned to as touchstone memoirs as you thought about your own. Did you? One's turning to me. I feel like Joe DiMaggio. <laughs> <laughs> um, there were a few. So I went to Wesleyan University, and I couldn't get into Annie Dillard's writing class because, like, hundreds of people tried, and she took twelve. But my friend got in, and she shared me Annie Dillard's annotated reading list. Mm -hmm. Wow! And I read my way through that list. Okay. It was three pages long. It was on like, uh, what was the long typewriter page? And um, so a lot of those, you know, so next to Saint Exupery, Wind, Sand, and Stars, she wrote World's Greatest Book. <laughs> <laughs> I can't disagree. <laughs> uh, and then next to Report to Greco by Cousin Zakis, World's Greatest Autobiography. <laughs> um, I knew Frank McCourt because we both taught at Stuyvesant. And I knew the story of him writing Angel's Ashes. And the true beginning is when he found himself in the present tense at a very early age on the seesaw with his brother. And he started out, it was something like, I am five. That simple sentence enabled him to start after a lot of false starts. And lo and behold, there I was in the present tense, reporting my age and saying where I am. Um, so yeah, I, I looked a lot to the past. I looked a lot, if you can believe it, to Thoreau, mm. you know, who didn't live long after you know, that memoir. And we don't even think of Walden as a memoir. Mm -hmm. yeah. This guy was really unlucky in love. <laughs> and he went off to write. Um, so I'm kind of in dialogue with you know, these, these old heroes, literary people, though. Um, I didn't care about the end. I was bored with myself. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and I, maybe a bit, I, I mean, I wrote some of it during the pandemic, and um, I remember one book that I really loved reading in the pandemic was A Nearly Normal Life by Chuck Mee. It's a wonderful playwright who was a teacher of mine, and he had polio, um, and he's talking about um, the polio wards when he was younger and the search for, for vaccines, and um, there was just something about his tone um, that that opened up something in the writing for me. Yeah. Well, I'd love to have you ask questions. Please come up. Um. This is where they either walk forward or the other way. <laughs> <laughs> Did please I go ahead. Right just step up to the mic, please. OK. I just want to tell you both that I do respect your journey. My question is for Ms. Rule. Did I say your name right? Yeah. Okay, um, life situations can cause delays in writer's block. You said it took you, I think, 10 years to complete your memoir. I'd like to know what catapulted you to completing your memoir without discarding what you started. Um, and um, what I, I want to know, um, was it a situation? Um, place or a time, what, oh, did you have a muse that kicked, that jump-started you? Mm -hmm. 
And what advice can you give one who begins to record memoirs but discards it mm -hmm. and then begins again? Mm -hmm. Can you tell me how to complete my memoir? Yes, <laughs> yes Very I good can. question. Um, we have my, two experts here. <laughs> in, in my case, there was a deadline from an editor. <laughs> <laughs> But anyone can, com can impose a deadline, and you can self-impose a deadline. And I think for me, the 10 years was more not even wanting to write about it, but once I determined that I would, it kind of poured out pretty quickly. Um, and maybe the experience of playwriting, too, gave me a little bit of that rush of sort of, and then what happened, and then what happened, and then what happened, mm -hmm. um, which is, can be helpful. Mm -hmm. um, the, the thing about starting and starting again, when I teach students, I call it the, the Penelope weaving and unweaving syndrome, like um, Odysseus's wife kept weaving and unweaving her tapestry every night so that she wouldn't finish it, so the suitors wouldn't get her. And so I feel like don't unweave, don't rewrite, just get to the end, just beginning, middle, and end, just get through it, know you're gonna write some bad sentences that will go on the compost heap, but don't, don't actually rewrite until you get through. Beautiful, thank you so much. Yeah, good luck. Thank you. Yes, please. Um, is there anything specific you learned throughout the process of writing your memoirs that you then might take forward to future uh, poems or plays or other literary forms? Thank you for that question, yes. That's a good question. I'm looking at you. <laughs> <laughs> Where have you gone, Joe DiMaggio? <laughs> I, yeah, I, I don't know. Um, there was something, though, that just conceptually that, that I never believed in and I believe in now, and it feels big, and that's the sense that um, language drives perception. Mm -hmm. I never believed that before. I thought perception was perception. You know, in Buddhism, they say, you know, without applying a concept to it, see it for what it is immediately. You know, outside of language, the enemy in that sense. But I think with human things, community things, language is necessary to perception. Um, and coming back into poetry, um, I think I got a couple more moves narratively. Mm -hmm. I go long better. I'm not sure I can, I don't know, what comes up for you? For me, I think it was sort of um, writing the book and felt like it enabled me to move on to the next stage of my life, both my actual life and my writing life. And sometimes I feel like you have to write the thing to live the next thing. And I think that was true for me. And I don't know how it will appear in my writing life, but I know that it permitted me to write the next thing. Please. Hi. Um, I, I've enjoyed this, this talk. Um, this question is actually from my 25-year-old transgender daughter who couldn't be here with us today. Um, she's been writing since uh, she was 11 years old. Um, or she, she's been writing for a long time, and when she was 11 year, years old, she felt something different. Um, she just transitioned uh, publicly, probably within the past uh, year and a half, came out to um, uh, my wife and I uh, about two years ago. And her question is, how, if at all, was your pre-writing, was your writing pre-transition influenced thematically and in other ways by your transness? That's a great question. Um, I think, uh, I don't think I could write long prose until I came out. Mm. I don't think I could sustain honesty for that long. I'll go out on a limb and say this is why Hemingway's short stories are first rate and his novels aren't. He couldn't sustain the honesty. Mm -hmm. um, so, and then with poetry also, you know, you're expected to write through a filter. You want to make it interesting. So with poems, I mean, I, I kind of take on the lineage personally. I tell myself privately of Elton John and Cole Porter. These two queer people were writing the songbook of heterosexual love. <laughs> but they were projecting from one side of a screen, and everyone on the other side said, they're playing our song, honey. <laughs> you know, and all these straight people were learning love from all these gay people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I was, in a, I was able to write poems I really did care about on every subject under the sun. 
And from the other side, other people seem to care about it too, every now and then, if you're lucky. Um, and, and so I could do something that had integrity artistically without you know, having to come out to myself or anyone else. Um, I hope that addresses some of what your very smart daughter is asking. <laughs> Um, my question is for Diana. Um, I'm actually in the process of writing my final university thesis um, on transmedicalism, and I actually use um, Spivak, the professor that you had. Gayatri Spivak. Yeah, yeah. her um, theory on strategic essentialism as part of that paper. So I, when I opened the book and saw her name, I was like, that's crazy. But um, I wanted to hear from you how you handled the struggles of physical presentation of gender, which I'm sure you have a unique experience with as someone who transitioned later, um, and also how you reconcile with the aspects of lost time in your life. Well, with lost time, there is no reconciling. It's grief. And you know, as I mentioned in the passage I read, I had absolutely no suspicion of how much there was, and maybe it was better that way. It's just grief. Um, but, you know, thankfully, grieving is a process. Um, you know, it's lost time. I, there was terminology used in the first part of your question. I, I need uh, to hear that again. How you handle um, the presentation, like physical presentation of your gender um, or gender in general? I, probably not well. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, okay, so. I had the trans people have the, the weirdest rites of passage, like, you know, the, your traniversary. It's ridiculous. <laughs> I try not to say these things publicly. It's crazy. <laughs> you know, you, 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 this category that's newly visible, see, you need these rites of passage. So I, was, I had the same sort of hormone anniversary at the very beginning as a lot of other people, but they were different ages, but we were the same trans age. So we get together at the diner, <laughs> <laughs> the good stuff diner, and um, overpriced. They're out of business now. But uh, I realized I was very different from the others because while other people w that I saw around me were incredibly uh, stressed out about clothing and presentation, I was happy because they hadn't been cross-dressers. Mm -hmm. you know? and, and so what, they, what was a chore for them was delight, finally, I get to use my wardrobe because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. you know, I, I had been cross-dressing for decades, mm -hmm. unlike these trans friends. So in a way, that was part of the, the joyful aspect, uh, you know, in, in that sense. In terms of, you know, the danger, you know, which is to me is the only useful thing to talk about with passing, is, um, you know, if you don't and you're getting gas in Texas, you could be in danger. Um, you know, in terms of that, I think it's, it's, it's similar you know, to all trans women and men. It's like you, you want to be as safe as possible sometimes. It's a very rich question. We could talk later if you want. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, I would love to. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Hello. Um, you both uh, mentioned briefly about experiences with spirituality, um, and I just wanted to know, uh, how do you connect that aspect to living in the physical self every day? Such a good question. I think that I've always thought of myself as not terribly embodied. Um, and maybe it's being a writer and being an observer. Or maybe it was I was sick a lot as a child. So I was in bed reading and not you know, out playing kickball. Um, and spirituality, I think, can be quite physical, it can be a physical sensation. And the process of meditating, in a way, is being inside your breath, being inside your body. Um, it's hard, again, to wrap language around your question. And some of these practices, I think, are trying to get out of the head and out of language into the body um, to have an experience of, um, of peace, uh, which is what, what so many of those practices are after. I mean, I always felt like I wrote from the body, you know, more than they had. I used to tell beginning poetry students, you know, what, what you do, you know, the journey of a writer, the journey of a poet, but also the journey of a poem sometimes is to come from here to here. 
you know, is to, you can't start here or finish here and only be here, but because you have to write with an intelligent heart, otherwise it's just a Hallmark card. You know, but then if it's, if it's only, you know, your lab coat thoughts, it could be very clever, but there's no heart. So the two somehow have to be dancing. Um, and I, I just think spirituality is the same thing. I, I, don't, I don't see any daylight between art and spirituality. Mm -hmm. oh, what an amazing uh, place to end this terrific conversation. Thanks to you both, Sarah Rule, Diana Getch. Uh, like I said, they will be down. Oh, yes, please, please. Uh, from 5 to 6 in Hall C. So check out this body I wore and smile, the portrait of a face. And um, see you again soon. Thank you.